Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Icon Cameras, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. I'm standing on one of these food plots that I'm going to be uh, constructing this year. And this one has, uh, uh, has really got me interested. It, it's a small, probably half acre plot, clear back in the timber, out on this ridge. And we hunted this a little bit last fall, but I didn't have any food in it and I just started to open it up. So the project now, <clears throat> excuse me, is to make this plot bigger and I'm gonna make it L-shaped. So that way the deer on that end of the plot can, they can be uh, basically relaxed and not even know that we're here. We can sneak out and possibly we could hunt that end and the deer on this end wouldn't know that we were here. So it's almost like having uh, two little small food plots. During the rut, generally the bucks will walk through the whole length of a small food plot like this. So it's not really the bucks that you're trying to you know, keep unaware. It's those does that come out and feed for a little while. Sometimes they'll catch you in there right at dark. So having an L shape is nice from that standpoint. There's a lot of work here uh, that needs to be done yet. I've got a couple of trees I gotta cut down and then there's a lot of stumps I've gotta remove. I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna, how I'm gonna get these stumps out. I've got a, a chainsaw with me and a shovel and one of the Cabela's LM50 tractors and it's got a brush cutter on the back and a bucket on the front. So we can do a lot of damage with that stuff but not enough damage to knock some of these stumps out. So we're gonna have to do uh, more manual work uh, on a few of these here. So that's, that's the project. Uh, I'm gonna get started on it today. I won't get it wrapped up today for sure but I wanted to show you this spot because this is something that if you've got a little bit of equipment, you can, you can do this yourself and it adds a lot of value to your property. If you're looking at it from an investment standpoint, like you're gonna potentially resell it, but it really produces some great hunting spots. Uh, this, this will completely transform this little ridge top from you know, more or less of just a small bedding area into a destination for these deer. So we need to get it ready. If I have enough time to, to get everything done this spring, it's gonna go into clover. Uh, if the forecast starts to dry out, then I'm gonna get it ready and then I'll wait until sometime toward the end of July, first part of August and put Big and Beastie in here instead for the first year. Uh, my goal is to get it done quickly within the next two weeks, catch a few rains, get clover started and uh, you know ha have clover in this plot, but it's not gonna be a bad thing either if it's Big and Beastie. That's the plan. I'm gonna grab the tractor here and clean up a little bit and, and get started in this process. We've got another segment for you in today's episode too. We've got another one of uh, Chef Aaron Neal's recipes. He calls them turkey dipping strips. Everything he cooks is good. So you might want to check this out and jot down a few notes and try this yourself at home. I'm going to get on the tractor and get to work. For these dipping strips, we're going to need a few simple items. Buttermilk, Cajun seasoning, beer batter, and beer. And of course, big old wild turkey breast. The first thing you're going to do is clean up your turkey breast. Cut your strips. Once you get your strips cut, you want to take your meat mallet on these wild turkey because they're uh, known to be a little bit tougher than regular turkey and just give them a few wax with your meat mallet. You don't have to beat it to the meat. It's just falling apart, but you just want to give some holes in it. It'll be easier to chew, be more tender feeling. And then it's on to our next step. First off, after you got your turkey breast tenderized, you're gonna take a little buttermilk. Enough you can submerge turkey tenders. Put them in there like so. Take your Cajun seasoning. Real simple to do. If you like it, a little extra Cajun, put a little extra in there. Flour, mix that up real good. 
Take your strip, put them in the flyer, roll them around. This stuff will make you a slappy mama kick a dog. It's so good. <laughs> Shake off the excess and bam. You got a real nice wild turkey dipping strip. If you want a little extra crunchiness, you can put it back in the buttermilk after you put the flour on it and then put it back in the flour. And then the perfect wild turkey dipping strip. I better get these battered up and get them outside in the grease because my partner's out there getting mighty hungry. We're out here next to the grease. You want your grease at about 375 degrees. When you drop these in here, they'll drop down to about 350, and that's where you want to cook it usually when you're frying. Oh, baby. You don't want to get too much in there at one time. You just take your time with it. When you know they're done, is when they go to floating, they got a good golden brown color. That's when you know you got some goodness going on. Dipping strips are ready. Come on and get them. Show us how you dip them. <laughs> they good? <laughs> well, I'm glad you all like it. <laughs> wild turkey dipping strips, folks. A few ingredients, something different you can do with wild turkey breast, and they're delicious. Until next time, I'm Chef Aaron Neal. This is Midwest Whitetail. Good luck and good hunting. Got a lot more work I'm going to do in this plot over the next couple of weeks and we'll bring it all to you. Uh, I guess we've got this episode and three more of the Midwest Whitetail off-season series and then we're going to knock off for a couple months for the summer. So we'll be able to bring you the wrap up on this food plot and uh, what the what the final look is. Hopefully we can get you a little aerial footage of it as well. We got some before and we'll, we'll bring you some after shots from the air. Talk for just a second about the strategy on a plot like this. And I mentioned the fact that I like an L shape so that it hunts bigger. Uh, the deer that are out feeding on one end, they aren't going to notice you when you sneak out. The way I've got this one set up, it's up on a ridge, like I said, and the, I can see the stand. It's in that big shingle oak tree, the tallest one behind me. And any wind uh, coming from this direction, which would be the south, is going to blow my scent out away from this plot. We can come in from that direction, hunt it, pretty conservative. Most of the bedding is going to be out in this direction out here, possibly uh, some in that direction. So in the evenings we should see deer coming in in front of the stand and working their way towards us. Uh, that way it's a lot more conservative when you're hunting a small food plot like this to set up on the opposite side from where the deer come into it. Too many people want to set up where the deer come into the food plot. But the problem with that is there's no safe wind direction because if you hunt with your scent blowing into the food plot, which is away from the direction that the deer are coming from, then as soon as they get out in the food plot, they're going to smell you. And if you hunt on a crosswind, 
you're invariably going to have some deer that come into the food plot from some place that you didn't expect, and they're going to catch you on the side. And if you hunt, of course, with your scent blowing in the direction that the deer are coming from, you might as well not even bother in the first place. So that's why I always like to hunt on the opposite side from where the deer are coming out. That, that way my scent can blow away from the food plot entirely. My overall strategy, I'm sure you've figured it out by now, is to be really conservative. I don't like to educate any deer, even if it means that my hunting season doesn't wrap up quite as quickly. Um, for me, I don't like that risk versus reward game um, when the, when the it tips too much toward risk. Uh, I would way rather play conservative and keep the season going, keep the deer uneducated, and then the buck that pops out that doesn't quite give me a shot, you know, will hunt that deer the next day too. Uh, you get aggressive and you get into these food plots a little bit too far. Next thing you know, that the buck that you are after, um, or you know, maybe even you educate some non-target deer, and then through their body language, um, you know, they make it known to all the other deer in the area that something's not right. So you just don't want to educate any deer. That's my point. And hunting these small plots that way uh, really is the ticket. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I'm going to get to work here and uh, keep checking back over the next couple of weeks. And I'm going to have a, a conclusion for you on this food plot. And uh, I know I'm going to be bringing you some more action on, uh, uh, let's see, we're going to be going up to Canada canoeing, uh, Drew and I. So we'll bring you hopefully some smallmouth bass footage and maybe a little bit of walleye and some lake trout footage from up there. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to be focused on food plots, uh, stand strategies, and, and some cooking tips, and just have a lot more fun here with these last few episodes. Well, I appreciate you joining me. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.